Well, welcome everybody um, to our second chat for students who have been offered admission or who are on the wait list currently. Um, we will continue to plan to hold these chats once a month. Um, for the current chat, of course, we have two um, current students joining us, current first year students for Burrell College. Um, we have Ms. Sidra Ali, and I'll let her say hello. <laughs> and then <laughs> we have Luis Zuniga as well. Um, so they'll be working to answer most of your questions, but of course, <clears throat> if you have questions regarding um, admissions or financial aid or those sorts of things, then Courtney, um, the director of admissions, and then myself will uh, chime in as needed as well. So if anyone has a question and wants to get us kicked off, if you'll type it into the chat um, and then we'll start answering. While we're waiting for some questions to come through, uh, Sidra or Luis, is there anything that you want to say about yourselves or about the program? Uh, go for it, Sidra. Um, if you have any questions about like why I chose BCom over other schools, I can definitely over other that. Um, and any like curricular curriculum questions or like things like that. I feel like a lot of people don't think about um, like what happens third and fourth year. So as you're making a decision where to go to school, definitely think about that because a lot of people don't think that that's a huge part of school. Um, I would just throw in. Uh, I know a lot of people um, going to BCom at post backs and things like that. Cedra definitely can help you out with that. Um, if you had like a little unconventional road, I can help you with that as well. Um, clubs, we both can tell you about anything. Um, I can tell you about the area because I'm from here. So anything like that, I'm good. So it looks like we do have a couple of questions coming in. So the first um, particular student events that are that are occurring and exams and things, um, but previously students already had the option. Um, to view all lectures and things online, but I'll let Sidra and Luis talk a little bit more about online access for um, like lectures and things. So it really hasn't affected us. All of our lectures, and this is one of the reasons I really enjoy BCom. all of our lectures are recorded, audio and video, which is a big deal because if you don't catch it on your first pass, you always have that available. So um, they are all exclusively online, but I mean, they've always been available online if that's something you wanted to do. Yeah, definitely going off of that. Like, I feel like my life hasn't changed because luckily BCom kept their like building open and I study like in a cubicle, like I'm actually in it right now. I'm like in this cubicle room and this is like where I actually watch my lectures and I study. So I feel like a lot of things haven't changed for me, um, which is kind of nice that it, like there hasn't been a huge adjustment. Um, but even for people who do go to lecture, um, luckily, since like um, Boomer said, like we have Panopto, a lot of people have used it before and are kind of familiar um, with how to use it. Um, so we have a question and we may or may not have an in-depth answer for this one, but we can talk a little bit about it. How do you think the step one being pass fail will impact the curriculum? I've actually done a, a lot of research on this. Go for it, CJ. I'll follow up on you. Okay, for sure. So I was going to say, like, first and foremost, since we do go to a DO school, um, Comlex is not changing to pass fail. So a lot of like students or most students, sorry, at a DO school take Comlex, right? So there you'll still get your um, score and things like that. But for people who, you know, maybe are trying to be more competitive or want to end up in a specific spot, um, that will be the effect of step one. So now it's kind of pushing to step two, but Boomer, go ahead for sure. You done some more research. Yeah, so like to echo what she said, everyone has to take Comlex no matter what. So you're gonna get a numerical score there. At the, and the DOs, the, after the merger with ACGME, um, the residency number of spots, just some of them went away, some of them grew. Um, it just depends on what specialty you're interested in. I'm personally interested in surgery, so I know there was a large number of spots that actually went away that were do specific however um you're always competitive if you put up your scores so comlex is going to give you a score the merged schools are now um being trained on how to read a comlex score plus you're going to pass step one but the biggest thing is you're going to have to absolutely nail step two so if you want a competitive specialty 
you have to absolutely crush step two. And that's really the only thing. The metric went from step one, now it's at step two. To go off that as well, like step one kind of tells you how well you'll do in step two. I mean, there is some difference, like some people do better on step uh, two, some people do worse on step two, depending on their step one score, but it is a um, like an indicator statistically. So you still have to, you know, study for that step one to make sure you did well so you can crush step two. And we're talking step, like as DO students, we take complex. You don't have to take step, but I mean, why not open up the entire country? That's my thoughts on it, um, because I'm trying to go to a, a competitive specialty. I have to. Um, it's just kind of the nature of the game. All right. Thank you, guys. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so if step one for the USMLE is pass or fail, then theoretically, if you get a really good score on the complex, and then you you pass the USMLE, wouldn't that make you more competitive than someone who only took the USMLE for an MD school? So, okay, I'm gonna be like completely honest with you. If you're trying to do something competitive and do an MD, traditionally MD um, residency, a lot of them don't know how to read Comlex. Like, yes, they're getting trained and stuff, but how long is that gonna take, right? So your step two score, if you're doing trying to do something competitive is going to really matter. Um, so I'm, I guess it doesn't necessarily make you more competitive to have a complex score. It's definitely nice because it shows schools like they can kind of see where you're falling with your classmates around the world or around the, the U.S. I get you. So it, yeah, it's it doesn't necessarily provide an advantage. Um, it's like anything. It, you're going to get what you put into it, what you get out of it. You know what I mean? Like if you want a competitive specialty, great. Score high on complex, pass the step, score high on step two, the whole world is open to you. I mean, we had a fourth year who matched ophthalmology. That's and urology. You know, just, huge. And urology, which are two insanely competitive specialties. But they killed all of their tests leading up to it. So it's not like you can pick and choose which one you want to do well. You just have to do well overall. And it's it's really on you. Okay, so we um, have another uh, set of questions coming through being typed in. Just a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat. Um, we'll try to get it in the order that they come in. Um, we just want to make sure that our, our presenters, Sidra, um, Louise, and Courtney, and myself um, are able to, to answer everybody's questions without the screen switching back and forth um, among too many different people. Um, but the next question that we had come through was how many BCOM students have matched with residency so far? And I'm going to let Courtney answer this one. There, there's a little bit of information that we can hopefully provide, um, but we're still awaiting some of that info too. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So Courtney and Lewis, Director of Admissions here, I've talked to a lot of you. Um, we do have match results coming in, however, there is still the soap and everything like that. And so we can't give out official results. However, um, without giving out specifics, we did extremely well and we are very proud of our fourth year. So there's only just a number of people um, that had either planned on maybe doing research or going into the soap. But I mean, faring um, this well with this being our first class with them uh, kind of being our first go through with curriculum and, you know, we've made so many improvements since then and then setting the benchmark. I mean, it could not have gone better for the fourth years and we're really, really excited about that. Uh, the early match results led us to believe that we would do really well, but we've fared even, even better than that. And so that means that residency programs aren't discriminating against us because we're a new school and things like that. You guys are getting what you need to actually match with residency. So if Sidra and Luis, if you didn't know that, <laughs> that's good news. Sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, we have to just wait until the actual day when everything is released and people are allowed to go through the soap and everything like that officially. So, but extremely well, very pleased. All right, um, another question related to current events. Are the current events with COVID-19 affecting our start date? Could it affect it in the future? If it does, it will be sent out through student affairs. We don't anticipate things going that long, but we've been 
really proactive on our campus about addressing that since a lot of, um, you know, even in admissions, a lot of our recruiting trips and conferences and such that are coming up over the next couple of months have been uh, canceled or rescheduled. I know you guys as students have had to do, um, you're gonna kind of switch to online things, but you've had so many labs at this point, four times more than any other school that you should be covered with all of your standardized patient labs and things like that. But if something was going to happen, um, again, they're even looking at commencement, if that is gonna happen since we had to cancel match, um, we'll let you guys know through email. Um, so a question about hubs, Sidra and Louise are both in, in the first year, um, so they haven't been assigned to hubs yet, but they might be able to tell us a little bit about um, hubs that are that are around and kind of what they've heard. But the question is, um, which are you both in, or I guess maybe which do you hope uh, to be in? Which will you list as your first choice? Go for it, Sidra. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm from rural New Mexico, so... Um, Eastern New Mexico is a hub, so I'm really strongly considering that, um, but I've heard good things about all hubs. I think it kind of depends what you want to do. Um, so there's a Las Cruces hub, an El Paso hub, um, Tucson, Albuquerque, and then there's a hub in Florida as well. So honestly, right now, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm kind of leaning towards like Las Cruces, Albuquerque, or Eastern. So for me, I'm from El Paso. Um, obviously, that something I'm going to rank pretty high, but I'm looking at El Paso or Eastern simply because I feel like um, I'll get the most hands-on experience. And I'm a hands-on learner. So if something's going on, I don't want a massive hierarchy in front of me um, before I can even see the patient, but that's just a personal preference. Um, the good thing about BCom, and I actually just came back from a conference out of uh, state. Don't worry. I'm good. <laughs> We're fine. Um, not in quarantine. We're good. But um, just came back from a conference and it was nothing but, I'm gonna throw it out there, a little bit of jealousy um, with our hubs because schools are constantly fighting to get their students into places and BCom has those ready-made. So, I mean, it's such a huge advantage with the rise of the number of schools, the number of students, um, secondary, I, I don't know what you'd call them, uh, providers are all competing for these spots at different locations to just practice and work. We already have those made. So it's a really, really big advantage BCom has. And going off of that too, like because New Mexico is in such a dire need of health professionals, I mean, we med students luck out because not only um, like we have these set hubs like Boomer is saying, but the reason, for example, Eastern is, you know, more hands-on is because you don't have a bunch of other med students who are with you in that rotation. And those physicians really make an effort to let you do a lot of things. Um, and because we are a DO school, I've heard a lot of um, input from other physicians that are um, currently like the um, like the physicians in charge of the third years, basically saying that great because there's you touching patients and doing soap notes and things like that. Um, even this weekend, I was in El Paso volunteering at a clinic, and one of the people in charge of the clinic was telling me how much like she's impressed by BCom students that come there. Um, so BCom definitely doesn't put you an advantage for your third year rotations. Um, I think it's a positive for sure. And that's actually why I chose BCom over other schools I got into was because of the hub sites. I guess one did. More to add, I'm so sorry. <laughs> one more thing right, to add right. is, uh, BCom does have kind of like a system. So if you have a family um, if your like spouse works in Las Cruces or something, you can um, like get extra points, so to say, so you can stay here. Um, so that's kind of a nice advantage for people that do have families. For sure. um, and it is based on a lottery system. So like Sidra was saying, um, students do get to indicate which is their primary choice. Um, typically, I think students are assigned most often their first choice, sometimes their second. Um, and I think very rarely, if ever, have students gotten all the way to their third choice. So, so typically you are able to select where you want to go. Um, and I did put a link in the chat to information about our hub site. So if you want to take a, a more in-depth look about what we have on our website related to those, um, it should be in the link at the bottom of the chat. Um, let's see. The next question is, has your interest in your future profession 
Um, so one of you referenced surgery. Has it changed since you started medical school? Um, do you feel like it's fluid with your different exposure to things or has it pretty much stayed the same for each? Um, this one's aimed at me right now. Um, so I came in not really knowing. I'm very open to everything. I'm still open to everything because I won't really know until you go through third year rotations when you're actually working in that specialty. That's when they say you find your people. Um, so right now, I think I like what I think I like surgery, but it'll change third year. As far as BCom, um, allowing you to find your path, so to speak. There's clubs for everything. Um, I migrated to surgery because I like the advisor. She's amazing, uh, Dr. Lenti. She is absolutely spectacular. She's a general surgeon, um, and Dr. Kamali, who we do our training with. So. Ecom has all the resources. There's clubs available. There's information out there as soon as you get here. Um, it's actually increased my interest in the subject um, to answer that question. Um, I mean, I guess like, like Boomer said, like, as you kind of learn more about different specialties and stuff or different subjects as your first year, you're like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. But um, like Boomer said, I think. Third year will mostly solidify that, but I am also taking time over this summer, for example, just to kind of figure it out, because if I do want to do something a little bit more, um, like a specialty, that's a little bit more competitive. I need to, like, make sure I have enough, like the right research or kind of know, like, what my board score needs to be. So I'm kind of taking some time this summer to try to figure it out. a good question again uh, so i know current events are really on our minds um so we do want you all to know that we're as an institution working really hard to stay proactive um, and make sure that everyone is taken care of in terms of their health and safety but also in terms of their educational experience but this question is how do we foresee the coronavirus impacting the hands-on part of becomes curriculum for first years will we still have omt classes uh, and patient simulation I think that might be more for Courtney. Uh, sure, <laughs> sure. I mean, like I said earlier, they've already gotten four times more hands-on experience than than other students at other schools. And so, as far as getting in your your kind of touch hours with clinicals or standardized patients and and all of that stuff, we don't anticipate that being a problem. I mean, we have to project out forward. However, I think all of us are hopeful that by the time you guys are getting onto campus, that this will no longer be an issue. If it is, then there is some online training, but Dr. Goldstein, who was in the military and, um, and is a first responder and everything, he's already been extremely proactive. So he already has a game plan for you guys and for anybody who needs to do any final exams or anything with standardized patients or clinical skills. And so, no, it shouldn't affect it. And, and really, your curriculum should be on par with what they're currently studying right now is, is what we're anticipating, especially by, you know, mid-July. So to jump, to jump off of Courtney's point, whatever we're affected by, the rest of the country is going to be affected by it. So we're not going to suddenly have less SPs than the rest of the country. We're going to have the exact same. The only difference is if everything goes back to normal, our SP exposure is unbelievable, which is one of the reasons, it's actually one of the main reasons I chose BCom um, was because the amount that we get to do. I mean, I, after coming back from this conference, we are a unique program that I've seen maybe 15, I don't know how many SPs we've had, maybe probably around 12, but other schools have had one. I mean, that's that's an experience you can't get um, by looking at a screen. But like I said, whatever happens, happens, but whatever happens to us will happen to the rest of the country. So it's not gonna be an isolated incident. And also going off of that, like for um, PCP, which is where we have our standardized patients are already talking about how they're gonna move them, um, like some, we might even have to move some in the fall, which is fine, like it happens. Um, and then for OMM, like, um, you know, our OMM department is so great. They're just so on top of everything that they're not honestly even worried. Like they're, they feel like they've taught us more than we even need to know as first years. So some of the stuff 
in second year, OMM is kind of like repeated. So like some stuff we learn in the fall, your second year of like school, you learn that again. So now they'll just kind of have to like move some things around, but luckily OMM is so on top of it that we're not missing any information at all. Um, which is something I really like about BCom that they're just so on top of it and they kind of like front end a lot of things. So then like, you know, in your second year, you have more board time or board studying time. So like second years technically almost are already done with OMM. Some of them are already done. Some of them still have one or two things left to do. So the, you know, that gives me hope that I'm not like worried about OMM and stuff like that. Cause I know that there's extra time later in my second year, if things get pushed to that. Thank you guys. Um, so the next question is again about um, clinical rotations. Does BCOM help students who need to move for their clinical location? I don't know, I hope so. I don't <laughs> still, still a first year, so I don't know yet. Yeah, I know. Um, oh, go ahead, Courtney. Oh, I was just gonna say, I know that kind of when you move to your main hub site, um, you kind of have to do that on your own. But sometimes you'll have um, like a smaller hub within your hub. I forgot what that's called. But anyway, so there there is like housing provided if you have to like go to a smaller hub. Um, but Courtney can definitely elaborate on that. Yeah. So when you're going into your uh, clinical years, your third and fourth years, financial aid does work with you on kind of setting a budget to accommodate any extra expenses. I know a lot of people will kind of utilize the max number of electives and and go back. Um, like one of our fourth years that did well in the early match, Horace, he went back to California. Obviously, the, the price of living is a lot higher for his third and fourth year than it was during his first and second year in Las Cruces. And so there are things in place like that. But as far as helping you move, um, that's, yeah, that's going to be on you as a student as it is at every other school. But we do work with you on making sure that you have enough money to do so and that, um, you know, you have contingency plans for if you set up preceptorships that are outside of our normal hub locations and things like that. And also um, budget early, um, take into account. I mean, if you save $20, $40 a month for your first year, second year, life gets a lot easier third year. Also, fourth year, early. fourth year is a very expensive year, so you definitely need to start saving up as soon as possible. We have a really good uh, financial aid department, too, who will work individually with students um, that will counsel them with those sorts of questions specifically, too, and help them budget year to year. So I did put a link to our financial aid um, department's page, and they maintain lots of resources there. But if you have specific questions leading into um, beginning, you're always more than welcome to reach out and, and we have financial aid advisors who can even help you get a head start on that, that sort of planning and thinking now too, because um, I know it's really, really an important thing to think about. Um, our next question is about board exams. With the merger of DOMD residencies, do you think it would be better to take both exams? I personally do, 100%, no question. I think if you um, aren't like too picky about where you want to go and your specialty doesn't show um, like there's too much competition, then it's fine. Like then you're okay to just take Comlex. But if you are kind of like, I want to go back home or, you know, my, com my specialty is a little bit competitive, then for sure take both. I mean, when you study for Comlex, you're studying for step one at the same time. Um, so like the exams are very similar. Um, the differences are just like the wording and then obviously the OMM component on the complex. So if you're taking one, you're already prepping yourself for the second one. Nice. Um, all right, this question is specifically for Luis, but then maybe we can elaborate a little bit on research too. Um, but Luis, with surgery as a prospect for you, do you find that joining in research is readily available for you um, to join in at BCom, especially during your second year or going into your second? So, going into your second year, um, you can apply for all these research programs. Um, they have a whole list available. They do an entire presentation. Dr. Antibetos did a great job this year of letting us know what was available. Um, I really, all my friends that are doing research had no problem finding a research of their choice. I'm choosing to do the anatomy distinction program because for me, anatomy is the key to everything. 
Um, and I feel like that'll help me personally. Um, but as far as doing research by itself, I mean, BCOM is affiliated or I don't know if they're directly connected or what have you, Courtney could expand on that to this multi, multi-million dollar research facility just down the road. Um, and research is absolutely available in any field that you're looking for, or if it's not available to help you find it. Um, the resources here in the faculty are amazing. So just to kind of jump in on that, we do have our own research facility that they have that you can utilize. And if you came, obviously all of you have come for the presentation, you know that we can work with New Mexico State University as well. And then our faculty are really open to, to working, but we have a whole department uh, set aside to research for posters and presentations and getting grants for that. A lot of our students do carry on uh, research that they've done previously at other institutions or kind of reach out from there. So I know it's readily available. We've had people get patents and do all kinds of stuff through through research with BCOM. So. Yeah, so I'm actually doing research um, this year, um, this summer, I guess. Um, so the reason I chose like my specific um, research program was because I knew that a paper was gonna come out of it, which is something that I felt like I needed um, for residency. Uh, but also, I kind of wanted to see like how research worked because there's I have some ideas of some research I want to do my third year um, while in rotation with some surgeons. Um, so that's kind of why I chose that route. But I know a lot of third years that continue their research when they're working with physicians and doing case reports um, or submitting their papers that they worked on like their fir the first summer and finishing it up their third year. Um, so BCOM definitely doesn't hold you back. I even have friends that like went to SF. Um, one of my friends is going to UCSF this summer to do some research. So um, it's not unheard of of people going back home to do research or going to a different university to do research as well. Great. I'm also going to put in a link to our um, institutional research page where you can read about the research that is going on. Um, also, if you've signed up for, for our newsletter, you'll hear blurbs about that too. Um, and then you can Oh, did we lose her? Um, okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> Got it. Here you go. <laughs> um, if you ever wanted to reach out to faculty, um, if you had an interest of researching with an NMSU, that would certainly be encouraged. Um, so this is another question for Courtney or, or for me, either one. Um, how are the COVID-19 protocols affecting the admissions process? Oh, that's been fun. Yeah. Um, so we have had to rework how we do. Luckily, we're in the last month of interviews and we only have a couple of dates left, but we have had to rework how it's going to happen. So when you guys came in, we did the introduction, we did the interview and tours of campus and things like that. We're still going to have that same process. It's just the faculty and the candidate will have to meet virtually much like this to do the actual interview since we don't want people traveling and a lot of states are actually kind of shutting down or discouraging traveling and we don't want them uh, having to be quarantined if they have to go back to work or school or anything like that. And so for the last handful of days, the process is still gonna run the same. It's just gonna have to be virtually. So that's been a, that's been a fun one to tackle. <laughs> For sure. Um, so with the next question, are you going to be sending out an academic schedule soon? Um, that will not actually come from admissions. That should come from student affairs. Is that right, Courtney? Student affairs. And then also, if you look in your student portal, which you should have access to and have already plugged in your social security and everything like that, they have all of that information on courses that you'll be registered for and everything. So whenever that's released, it will go into that portal. And that's a portal that you're going to use for the next four years as your as your student portal. But that's where things get released if they're not released by student affairs or email. There's also a link um, in the chat now at the bottom to the pre-matriculation checklist. Um, so just the different things that you will need to be aware of. But again, these things will have come to you in email or you have access to particular things through your student portal, like Courtney mentioned. Um, but if you want to follow any of those links, I believe the current student handbook is linked. 
Um, on our website, you're able to find current academic calendars. Of course, things might change for your class or be, be specific to you. Um, but if you just kind of want to get an idea for how things have looked in the past, those are always um, there on our website. Um, another question about hub sites. Is there potential for expanding hub sites to California? Is there anything that I can do as a student in terms of communicating between programs to aid this process? Sure. So you can always set up preceptorships within that. I don't know about a full blown hub, even though we do have a lot of students that come from California. There's a little bit more that goes into an actual hub with rotations and things like that. But if you want to rotate back there during your third and fourth year, mainly your third year during electives and then your fourth year is essentially um, pretty wide open, depending on how you schedule it. You can definitely do that. And there are things as a student that you can do to make sure that that's all in process. So a lot of our students do that. They travel back and and we already have a lot of them uh, from California who've already built those pathways. So if that's something that you're interested in, depending on if you're going NorCal or SoCal, we have different pathways already kind of established through some of our students that have already gone through and set up preceptorships there. And just going off of that, that's like um, a, one of the another reason like I chose BCom is they're so lenient about letting you go um, to like rotate rotations or audition rotations like wherever you want, um, especially during your third year. So if you want to go back home and do some rotations, becomes pretty like flexible and lets you kind of figure that out, which is really nice. So Sidra, earlier you had mentioned. Um, a wish to go to Eastern New Mexico, or that that might be one of your top hub sites. Can you talk a little bit more about um, why it's more hands on there? Um, yeah, so I guess the 1st thing um, is that there's not other med students there. Um, also, they don't even have residents. So you kind of become that um, second hand to the physicians, which is really nice. Um, they kind of let you kind of um, be more independent and just start seeing patients yourself. Um, I know people in Eastern like we're delivering babies on the first day by themselves. So like it's definitely um, like very hands on. Um, but Luis, I think, talked about how he was thinking about it as his first choice. So I can let him um, chime in as well. It's I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. I don't know if he's still here, but is he? I'm here. Oh, okay. I'm here. Um, no, just basically the same thing. Um, as a med student, you're going to get hit with the hierarchies of attending uh, residents throughout the years and then fourth years, third years. Um, that's why Eastern is a really good advantage. It's like she said, you jump in first from day one. Another thing to think about, and I always encourage people to at least keep Eastern in their mindset is because when I um, previously to doing this, I actually co-owned a scribe company. And so we would go and train doctors on using the EMRs out there and things, but they have since these are smaller communities of about 50, 40,000 or less, they bring in a lot of physicians from all over the country. And so you're making connections to people who don't actually live there full time. Usually they come and do two weeks on, two weeks off and rotate back. And so you get a lot of access to people who are all over the nation and have their own connections and things. And, and again, it's because you're not competing with other students. So there's two kind of really big benefits to going to that hub. Um, we can I think also a other benefit that. is that, um, you know, like you, a lot of people think you don't see a lot like in Roswell or in Eastern New Mexico, but that's not true. Um, there's a lot of different cases you'll see um, because again, like it is an underserved community. You're gonna see things um, that you might not see in an urban setting. Usually in an urban setting, you're kind of, like it becomes the same thing again and again, but literally every day is completely different in, in a rural community. Um, and the nice thing about Roswell is that it has like a, like most of most of the Eastern like cases come into Roswell. So it's kind of like the main hub before Roswell sends out cases um, to like Albuquerque, El Paso, Tucson. Um, but they've kind of made some changes, like now they're trauma three um, and they have tele uh, medicine too. So they don't, they, they keep 95% of their cases, meaning only 5% of their cases actually get shuttled to like university hospitals. So a lot of people think like, oh, it's a small town. Like th those like um, 
cases are going to get shuttled out. No, that's not true. They're doing a lot of work there. Thank you guys for speaking to that. Um, the next question, do you feel like you can balance extracurriculars, volunteering, sports, spending time with family and friends um, alongside your curriculum? Super easy, right guys? <laughs> um, CJ, you wanna go first or me? <laughs> no, you did a post back, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I can, I, I'll go first. So, so for me, um, the only way like med school works is if I keep two things like in my life happening every day. One of them is getting eight hours of sleep and the other one is working out. So if those two things don't happen, something else in my schedule is like gonna get kicked out so I can do those two things. Um, so personally for me, it's just all about keeping that balance and really doing the things I wanna do. Um, so I am like, pretty involved with extracurriculars, but the reason I do that is because I can't study all day. So when I do take my breaks, it's volunteer breaks, which I call them, even though I know that doesn't sound like a break, but for me, like I find so much joy in those things that I like, those are my breaks and I find joy in that. So I feel like I'm constantly um, able to just take a break from school and then um, get back to it. But, yeah. um, so for me, I, I came after having a year off. Um, I didn't get in the first time, truth be told, um, but I also applied wrong. So that was my fault. Um, organized, I guess would be the best way to put it took me through the first block. So you get hit hard and fast. I wasn't ready for it. Um, still did, still did fine. So we're good, but it was a lot of late nights. So if you start early and just be very, very organized, I have all the time in the world. I hit the gym every day. I'm president of a club, vice president of another, um, coming up on a ton of touch hours, which is a volunteering. There's time for everything. If you get organized. I think also like you have to make time like some weeks are going to suck and like kind of like boomer is saying like you have to make sure to do things that make you happy so like for me like so we usually have exams every two weeks so i know that first week i can kind of spend more time like doing some community service or like stuff for my clubs and then that second week i kind of like let those things go and you know just focus on school and a lot of people will do that like you'll notice that the best time to talk to someone about a club is that first week before the second week of an of a test um, so again, like if you keep yourself organized and really come in, um, with that mentality, you'll be okay. But just also remember that, um, every block is different. Like you're constantly adapting as well. Advice. <clears throat> All right. The next question is about, um, the Braille outreach and engagement report. So, um, if you've been keeping up on our website and taking a look at our institutional news, um, then maybe you're aware of that. But the question was whether that report, outreach and engagement report is released annually. So Courtney, I'll, I'll let you answer that one. I know just a little bit about it. Sure, yes, it is. So that is something that we do as an institution and that we send out and post on our website annually, yes. All right, can we, or when can we expect financial aid packages? Will there, will there be any scholarships handed out? So there is a scholarship committee, mainly it is need based or they will select applicants that are incoming that kind of qualify for those scholarships at this moment, but you can always reach out to financial aid and ask about that. And then as far as packages and things like that, you can start applying for Title IV now and, and get that going. If you are if you are on the wait list, you can do that as well. It's not like they're gonna pull it if you if you don't matriculate and things like that. So reach out to financial aid if you need to. We are out of the office now, but we have a plan in place on how to still communicate with applicants as they call in and things like that. So just reach out to them. That's when they have a different timeline, but you can already start doing a lot of this stuff and being really proactive on it. Probably the best way to to get in touch with them right now is is to email. Um, we will be responding to voicemails and things, but as we're out of the office, email is the quickest. Um, and so earlier I linked the financial aid department's page. If you take a look at that page, um, the contact information should be there too. Of course, you're used to communicating with us through admission. So if an email or two for financial aid gets filtered our way, we can always pass them along too. The next question is, would you recommend Sonoma Palms or the flats? Um, I am currently sitting in my Sonoma Palms apartment, so I can highly <laughs> recommend that one. Do you, I can like do a little spin and show you my living room. Um, <laughs> but I will say um, I've really enjoyed living here. 
Um, we have a really awesome balcony with like a view of the organs, um, which is lovely in the evenings. Um, the flats are really close. So I don't know, Sidra, Luis, if, if either of you have experience with the flats. I live there. I love it. It's also because I live at school. So, um, I mean, I see a question up here about like a, a day. I, I live at school. Um, so it's really convenient coming home at, you know, midnight driving five minutes. If that the NMSU gym is four minutes away, I go every day. So it's, I can't beat it for the convenience of the lifestyle that I have. So I'm in a really weird situation. I've lived in Las Cruces. This is my third year living in Las Cruces. So I've lived in a lot of places in Las Cruces. Um, first, I lived in Tuscany villas and apartments and I loved it. Um, it's really similar to Sonoma and the flats. It's kind of um, in the middle of town though. Um, I've also lived in Sonoma Palms. I really enjoyed it. Um, um, right now I currently live in a house. Um, I live with a second year and his wife. Um, and I really like living in that house because like Boomer, I also live at school. So I don't know why I should pay so much rent to like have an empty apartment. So I only pay $400 a month and we have a three bedroom house and one of the house or one of the rooms is a study room. So if like for some reason school gets closed, I can use that room um, and I have a desk and everything. Um, but my second year roommate is moving to Tucson next year. So I'm moving to the flats um, again because of the convenience of how close it is to school. Also, the flats has like study rooms, so does Sonoma Palms. The flats also has like OMM tables. So honestly, I feel like like all the apartment complexes at like in Las Cruces are really nice. Um, if you're trying to look for a like try to like keep a budget or I guess keep a cheaper amount, um, living in a house was like really great. I wish I could still do it. I would totally do it if my roommate was staying here. Yeah, so there's a yeah, there's a Facebook page. Uh, dedicated totally to housing and um, as you have your class pages and things like that, like she's saying, as people go and rotate to their hubs, they can let you know, hey, my lease is up or this has been a really great place to live. Do you want to, you know, move in kind of after me because they're going to have an opening. So there's there's lots of ways to communicate with current students and, and get the skinny on where to live. <clears throat> All right, so another question about research. Can you do research as a first year student? So you can do research your first year. Um, a lot of professors um, kind of don't like you to do it, especially in the fall. They just You just wanna get used to med school. Um, it's a lot, you just wanna get used to the routine. Um, but I kind of started a project like this semester. Um, but if you are traditionally doing it through like our research program, then you'll start it in the summer. Um, but re like research is like open basically. Um, so every BCom student gets an advisor. So what I would do if I were you is talk to your BCom advisor, um, which is usually like a faculty member and see what they think if you're ready for it. Um, if your grades are like where they should be to see if you have time for it, things like that. I completely agree. Get your grades in order first before you extend yourself and have too many responsibilities. There's only like three or four of us that are doing research. Um, so. Like, like, kind of that kind of tells you, like, it's not, it's not easy for sure. All right. Um, question about students on the wait list. Does the school favor letters of intent if placed on the wait list? Um, so I, I will say your position on the wait list is, um, it is ranked and it's based on your interview scores and your rubric scores. So a letter of intent is not going to necessarily change your placement on the wait list. Um, but what it will do is let us know that you're still interested. Um, so anytime we should do a, a pull from the wait list, um, you know, sometimes we have to move through <clears throat> multiple students um, to fill a single seat if they're no longer available. So if you've provided us with a letter of intent, um, we at least know that, that you still have an interest, you're still available. But I'll let Courtney speak a little bit more to that too, if there's anything else to add. That's about it. We will upload it into your file. It won't necessarily change a decision, but it is very helpful for us if you want to provide it just again, so we know that you're still available. Um, and, and that's really all it will do. So you letting us know that you want to come there, us knowing that you want to come there. And so as we work down our wait list in order, at least we know, um, you know, once we hit you that that you should be able to take the seat and we can kind of gauge a little bit better. So it is helpful if you would like to provide it. 
All right, another rotation question. Can you rotate virtually anywhere for rotations? You get elective rotations if they, you apply to it, if they accept you, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't be able to rotate there. So your like core rotation would be at your hub site, but your elective rotations, you can do wherever. Um, you obviously just have to start looking early. Apply as the long first as, day. Yeah, and as long as you don't mean like virtually like this. So <laughs> and apply anywhere in the nation, no one's gonna let you do this. So just to clarify. All right, um, so we kind of touched on this before, but can we go a little more in depth on what a normal week like as a first year student is? Um, so like when you start class um, and in for a day, how much study time you have throughout the day, those sorts of things. Go for a boomer. Um, if we have a mandatory class, I will be at that class. Um, if the class is not mandatory, I tend to uh, just go in the library. Um, but the good thing is everything is audio and video recorded. Like I said, I'm not a class person anymore. I undergrad, I never missed. I just feel I can study faster um, and more efficiently on my own. So I go to the library. I'm there by 715 and then I'll stay. I'll go to the gym at some point whenever my workout buddies are ready and then uh, Um, so for me, my day kind of starts early, but I'm just like a bird, I guess. But so I kind of get here like six to seven ish. Um, and then I stay in this room that I showed you guys. Um, I'm kind of like a hybrid, like online learner. So I usually like probably like 85% of the time do classes online. Um, but if it's like a professor I like or something I know is going to be a little difficult for me. So I need to like, like see the content more than um, a few times I go to class. Um, and then, yeah, so also another nice thing about BCom is that they tend to front load. So like a Monday, you'll have like stacked classes. So classes like don't end to like two or three, um, but towards the end of the week, you'll be done by like 12. Um, so that's really nice. And then on Tuesdays, um, first years have OMM. So we have lecture to like 12, which includes an OMM lecture. And then you, you have lab. So you have a lot, you have a lab from like for an hour and a half. And then after that, you just have study time. Um, and then Wednesday we have PCM. Um, PCM is like where we do kind of the additional um, things that we need to hit for boards, like biostats, epidemiology, ethics, things like that. Um, and then Thursdays we that's when we learn our like patient centered um, like stuff. So that's when we do our standardized patients, where we learn to do different like abdominal exam, um, musculoskeletal exam, things like that. And then Fridays um, at the beginning of a block we have anatomy lab, which is when we see the cadavers. Um, or, and we also have an ultrasound lab, um, but if it's not the first week of a block, then we usually don't have that. Um, so that's kind of like, I guess, the whole week. Um, but for my specific day, I usually get here around seven. Um, I study like until like five ish and then I go to the gym and then I come back. And then I either stay to like eight or nine, depending on the day. All right. Thank you. In depth answers. Um, so the next question is about tuition. Should students expect tuition to increase about $60,000 within the next four years? And is there a cap policy? That's not really within our realm since we are private for profit. Uh, that's not something that would be kind of at our pay grade level to to discuss. There has been a rise on tuition, but it's not been that large since it did open. Um, but I'm not sure if there's a cap policy or anything like that. And, and again, um, in four years, if you matriculate, that's really either on your way out or or kind of a non-issue. But I'm not. That's not something that we discuss as a board level question. So I don't want to want to give information if I don't have it on that. Um, a follow up question to the Southern California rotations. Um, was the answer to that question applicable to the whole third year rotation? So I guess um, the option to do uh, a rotation outside of the set clinical sites that we have. 
I don't believe so. I believe it's just for your electives. You are assigned a hub and you have mandatory assignments. Correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but you'll have mandatory assignments within your hub and then you do have electives and those electives are what you can use to go on away or set up preceptorships outside of your normal hub. Yes, exactly. So you can do three, you're, you have three electives your third year, so you can do those three wherever you want. Um, and then your fourth year, I think there's only one mandatory elective that you have to do at your hub. Other than that, you can go for audition rotations, elective rotations, whatever. All right. Um, so this question is for Louise specifically. Can you touch on your year in which you reapplied to medical school? What did you do during that time? Um, I worked, I ended up becoming a head scribe. And then I worked a second job and redid my letter of uh, my personal statement. I feel like that was something that I did not have as strong as I should have. So redid the personal statement, um, worked and really just tried to get references from my, uh, my bosses by doing better in my work, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Um, <laughs> any other advice from, from us, Courtney, from admission standpoint on what people can do in a gap year? I mean, those are both very helpful. I think making sure that you're very thorough on your application, making sure that you check the programs that you are applying to, to make sure that you actually fit within either the number or the metrics that they're actually matriculating, or if they have something that says must meet these minimum requirements that you're at least above that line, because that uh, will, will kick you out of a lot if you're not careful and you think that you're so close, but if it has certain keywords for minimum requirements, you need to be very careful about those. But I mean, really, I think it's, we're seeing more and more either gap year or two or second cycle applies do better and actually matriculate. And it's either because they understand how the interviews go and they've been able to do better at those and they've strengthened their application or just in having the gap year to get uh, kind of fill gaps that they've had just from going to school and things like that. So that is becoming more and more the norm instead of people coming straight out of school um, and undergrad, we're seeing more and more with one or two years after. You don't want to get too many after that. All right, uh, if we have already submitted the FAFSA, should we um, just wait? So I'm, I'm guessing that means, can we already submit the FAFSA or should we wait at this point? Um, and, and again, financial aid is gonna be able to give the best information on those sorts of timelines, um, but I certainly have heard our advisors and our financial aid director um, say, you know, it is already open, it's already available. So if you have been waiting, but you have the information and you're able to go ahead and submit your FAFSA, um, the, the earlier, the better. There is one about study tips, Natalie. Oh, thank you. Any we are almost out of time. Yeah, so last couple yeah, of questions. One or two final questions, but I think this is it. Um, are there any study tips or techniques you'd like to share? Last year again. Last year again. Oh, can you hear me? Um, vacation, have fun. That's what everybody <laughs> says. <laughs> I know everyone says it, but um, when you get in here, if in order to succeed, you're all in. There's no question. You you're all in from from the get go. So I would say have fun. Um, if you really want to do something. Anatomy never hurt anyone and uh, some biochem. That's probably what I would suggest. My tips always to people who are about to start med school is literally like find good hobbies, like start working out. So that way you've already like created it, like put it into your system. Um, you know, just like cook. start creating good habits for yourself. Learn how to cook some things. Like honestly, just figure out like what, like how you kind of see your day going. Um, and obviously things will change. Um, yeah, I think definitely take some time off, um, make sure you're 100% ready to just get going. 
Um, but I guess studying tip wise, um, just make sure you have your resources ready, like have first aid, um, like get like some resources from your upperclassmen during orientation. Um, people are really nice about sharing stuff like that, especially at BCom. Um, so the nice thing about BCom too is you get like a big, so you can ask your big, or honestly, like if you ask it on the Facebook group, like any of us are gonna hop on there and give you our like solicited and uns unsolicited advice. Um, so if you have any specific questions for when the school year starts, just let us know. And I, I know I'm in I'm in your all's Facebook group, so you can DM me. I don't know if CJ is also. I am too. Yeah. Is there any specific topic you would suggest focusing on in terms of like study over the summer? One person mentioned they're focusing on anatomy. Um, but if there's something else you might recommend if you're going to focus on one area. I think if you've never taken something that's big, like for med school before that would be worth like, just, I don't know, maybe looking over or just understanding the basics. So, like, if you've never taken micro, just take a second to see, like, what it's about, like, literally the intro chapter, just so you kind of have an idea, like a big picture in your head. If you've never taken physio. It doesn't hurt to like look at some Khan Academy videos. I mean, it's more just about like familiarizing yourself so you know how you would study for that topic, not actually knowing about it. Cause you do have enough time to learn the material. It's just hard. It's more about like knowing how you're gonna sit down and learn it. So you're not wasting time like trying to find resources, um, like deciding if you're gonna take notes or if you're just gonna watch a video. Like I feel like those are the things like that happen in med school. It's all about saving time. Courtney, this is a question for you. What percentage of the admitted class will be students who were on the wait list? Oh, goodness. Uh, that fluctuates every year. Honestly, it's completely student driven. So we're going to make the offers. Again, we're, uh, I think we have five interview days left in which we could do seat offers if, if we have those available. And then from there, that wait list is set. And so we will pull as needed from there to fill the class through July. And so we really can't, can't say on that. Um, I think the highest we've gone is a three to one ratio for seats offered to either seat decline or, or pull from the wait list and things like that. And so, um, but we haven't seen a lot of turnover in those that have paid their deposits, but there is a multiple acceptance list coming out in May, which always generates a little bit of turnover. And then uh, we'll move maybe through a decent chunk as we get really close to the start of school, sometimes just because it's really hard for somebody to move last minute and get down here. So sometimes that those last two or three spots end up taking 20 people on a wait list to fill three just because of the time constraint, things like that. And so it's really hard to gauge since it is so driven by just openings whenever we have them. Two more quick we, questions. Yeah, we, we include you guys in these discussions because we do anticipate pulling some of you up off of that. And so we want you guys to have that information readily available, make sure that you guys are as prepared as those that already have seats and everything to make sure that you're ready to go if, if the, the call comes. More quick questions before we go um, when you kind of touched on, but should students on the wait list submit the immunization form by the May 1st deadline? No, so if you haven't gotten a seat, don't spend the money on on things like that. You can do your FAFSA because it won't be withdrawn. But for immunizations and, and things that you're paying out of pocket expenses, don't do that until you get your seat offer. We don't want you to spend money if you don't have to. And then um, final question for the prerequisite coursework, it says eight credit hours. Is that semester units or quarter units? That is referring to semester hours and we do a, an equivalent for uh, quarter hours. All right, so that was the final question that came in. Um, thank you all so much for participating. Um, I did just wanna say we will send out a follow-up email um, likely in the morning or throughout the week, um, once we get the recording to come through with a recording of this. So if you wanted to go back through any of the questions that you asked or that were answered, you can. We are also going to send out a very short survey since we've had a couple of opportunities with current students um, to kind of gauge what you would like to hear from us next, what you would like to offer. If you want more time to chat with current students, 
Um, if there are other sorts of things that you want us to, to chat about in these virtual chats, that'll be your opportunity to let us know. Um, and also things about timing as well. Um, so take a, keep an eye out for those things. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much to Sidra, to Luis uh, for joining us for this. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you know, anybody? Thanks for having us. And if you guys have any questions, like reach out to me and Boomer for sure. We'll definitely answer your questions. Yeah, and if there's any confusion, my name on Facebook is Boomer. Um, I know that <laughs> CJ keeps calling me. That's what I've gone by since I was a kid. Um, so it won't say Luis, just FYI. I was wondering about that. We were trying to yeah. figure out. We had to go through the name sheet. And I was like, they call him <laughs> Boomer. I can't find him. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Bye, everyone. We'll see you probably next month. All right. Bye. Stay well. Stay safe.